This is talk about work we are doing right now, supported by Niels from Janus Fellowship and working with Ray Ashure here on something that may be a new candidate to replace silicon, the funding material for right now with computers. We are focused on oxide interface and hopefully I will demonstrate that this is a new chance to realize new electronics. My name is Lu Li. I'm a third year fellowship, a third year fellow here. And uh, now let's just look at what we have right now. No matter you are a PC guy like me or a Mac guy, you are always using this, right? Intel CPU. The funding, the, the, the heart of that is actually silicon-based transistor. In this transistor, what's special? There's a so-called electrical field effect to change the charge property. We apply a DC voltage to the interface. We make it conductive or make it insulated. By doing this way, we have a logic one or have a logic zero. So that's one thing. Using the charge property, controlling the conductance through the electrical field effect, we are making faster and faster computers in these days. On the other hand, as you know, we are having larger and larger hard drives. In your Gmail account, you may have gigabytes hard drive storage there. That's using the other interesting property of electrons, the spin. Spin is the fundamental property of electron. In each electron, there's a magnetic moment. That's just like a magnetic moment of a small magnet bar. In certain materials, these moments or these spins are parallel to each other. They are aligned and they give so-called magnetic ordering. By realizing that, you may be able to have this hard drive disk that give you, now this, but it's the, the wonderful large storage. Okay, so this is second property and second usage. Now people are, dream, are dreaming, hopefully we can get um, electronics using both properties, spin and a charge. Hopefully we can get this kind of device. On one side, it's a junction between one kind of magnetic order state to the other magnetic order substance. Hopefully we can use the electrical field effect to control spin directions in between. By doing that, we may change the resistance between this. We may be able to get a much larger, much denser hard drive to use in, fu in future electronics. This is a dream. Unfortunately, reality, no. The marriage between these two properties, spin and electron, they are missing. Typically, for the, for the most sub semiconductors we are using these days, spins are behaving like this. They are pointing to different directions, into different random directions. They cannot give such a beautiful parallel magnetic order state. Because of this, such a property, such a wonderful dream cannot be realized. And for me, for experimentalist, we hope to find certain kind of materials to realize both properties, charge and spin. As I emphasize, to use the charge, you want to have an electrical field effect. You want to use certain kind of DC voltage to tune the density of charge. For spin, most of the time, you need the ordering of these moments. You want these spins to be parallel to each other at certain temperature. Okay, so now, can we have such a material? Well, I would say some interface, some materials based on these boring insulators may be a good candidate. Let me start with the boring stuff. These are uh, oxides. Uh, there are some oxides just like what we have in a chalk, for example, or in glass. There's nothing special there. It's insulator, means you cannot push any electrons through that. It's non-magnetic. You cannot have certain kind of this magnetic bar or directions or spins in these materials. And uh, there, are, there are structures like this. To show the structure, I just want to emphasize how small they are. Basically, this shows, the, this shows strontium ion or titanium ion. The distance between neighboring strontium ions tells me the unit cell. It's roughly 0.38 nanometer. Okay, so now they're boring insulators. If we can make them 
put, make insulate between them, bring these two together, we may have something new. Here is the picture of the interface sample. Basically, it's a substrate of strong chimney By the way, during my talk, I will use STO to stand for this long formula and LAO to stand for this long formula. Okay, so my substrate is STO. It's just, just like glass. And there's actually a five unit cell, very thin layer of LAO on top of that. It's transparent, just like a glass. Now, if we look at the cross section by an electron microscope, there's indeed an atomic sharp interface between LAO and STO. Okay, so this is the material. What's the property? It's conductive. The interface made out of these two insulators, STO substrate, LAO thin film, is conductive. As we can see here from the plot of resistivity, resistance versus temperature in two different regimes. In this regime, it's a very, very low temperature, close to zero. And in this plot, it's from the lowest temperature we can achieve all the way to room temperature. Both plots show that they are indeed conductive, even though the building blocks are insulating. Moreover, at a very low temperature, these two samples become zero resistance. What does that mean? That means we can transfer certain charge, certain current, without even heat loss. Okay, so I'm proposing that hopefully this candidate, the interface between LL and STO, may become a candidate using candidate of electronics using charge and spin. As we demonstrated before, to use these two properties, we need to demonstrate these two fundamental, fundamental measurements. First, for charge, we want to use electrical field effect to control the density of the charge. For spin, again, we want, to, we want to look at the moment, look at the magnetic property of that. Now let's first look at this property. Electrical field effect, what does that mean? That pretty much means we have a capacitor and we bring in charge by charging up this small capacitor. In this way, we, make, we put charge in and make it conductive. Now that's exactly what we are going to do. This is a sketch, side view of my sample. And this is a top view picture of the sample. On top of the, this interface sample, as you can see, we have these circular top gates. And the corners, they are omega contacts. They are contacts and the corners by deep a hole and put in certain metal and that. Okay, by doing this, we are having a conductive interface, we have a metallic top gate. This is exactly the capacitor we are talking about. Okay, as you also can see here, it's a capacitor between the top gate and the interface underneath that. Okay, now let's think about what will happen as we apply a DC voltage on top of that. Okay, suppose we have a conductive interface. Capacitance, as we know, is determined by the area and the distance. If this is conductive, we'll have a bigger area, so we will have a more or less constant capacitance in high voltage end. Now, what happens if we bring certain negative voltage to, to make all the charges carrier here gone, to get rid of everything? Well, that means that the, this part is missing, the area will drop to almost zero. As we can see here, the capacitance is almost nothing. It drops, well, later we can see it drops by almost 90%. Okay, so seeing this sharp change in capacitance is indeed a demonstration of the electrical field effect in this kind of substance. This is the prediction, and what's the result? That's shown here. Here we're plotting the capacitance versus gate voltage of one device. I'm only showing data taken at one temperature, one measurement frequency, but basically you get, you get a picture. There's a indeed a sharp change in the capacitance as a function of voltage, and that's where all the charge carriers are pushed away by a negative gate voltage. And the high carrier densities, they are more or less constant. That's where we can make the, we can, that's where we can use the conductivity as logic one, for example, and this is where it's a logic zero. Okay, so great, we have the electrical field effect. 
But now, the most surprising part is what happens at the very low carrier densities. The capacitance gets larger than the normal geometric capacitance. What happens there? Seeing such a big enhancement means that we are having the capacitance bigger than what we can achieve, bigger than the normal, thing you, normal formula you learn in your ENM class. And that means the interface likes to attract more charge, likes to attract more field lines, and such a low carrier density. This is a surprise to us, because typically, yes, capacitance enhancement has been seen in clean semiconductor interface samples. There, the interaction between electrons lowers the energy and raises the capacitance. How, however, here, we're talking about the interface made out of something like, like rocks, like chalks. They're dirty. There are a lot of disorder in the interface. Such a super dirty substance, it's hard to believe we can see in such strong capacitance enhancement. But indeed, the measurement shows that. OK, no matter what the origin is, such a strong capacitance enhancement leads to a potential application, means use, use a capacitance, capacitance enhancement to reduce the heat dissipation in computer chips. What does that mean? If you are using a laptop, you know that at certain, after a certain time, it's heating up, right? That's one thing to limit the speed of our computer chips. We cannot put infinite numbers of transistors onto a small chip because to operate that, it will heat up everything. Now, hopefully, with such a small, such large capacitance enhancement, that means smaller operating voltage. Smaller operating, operating, operating voltage means smaller heat. Uh, by using the quantum mechanics property to have this capacitance enhancement, hopefully, we are able to reduce the heat dissipation and we can make much faster computer chips. Okay, so, so here we demonstrate the electrical field effect, demonstrate how we use a charge property of our oxide interface, these new materials. Now let me touch a little bit about the spin property. As you uh, remember, the spin property, the missing of magnetic ordering is exactly the missing part of silicon, of the computer chips we are using right now. Can this interface show magnetic ordering? Well, again, for experimentalists, we want to measure the moment first. We want to measure how the magnetic moment in this interface behave in, certain mag in, in a small magnetic field. But it's challenging. How can we measure the magnetic moment of a single atomic layer interface? It's just one atomic layer. As you can see, it's almost transparent. You cannot really see that. The volume is really small. Well, so that means we need a very sensitive magnetometer. The principle is quite simple. Again, it comes back to simple ENM. Suppose we have a small moment in plane. Apply external field H. This will generate a torque, m cross h, and such a torque will deflect the candlelight, will deflect this, this substance, this sample. Now, the principle goes like this. Suppose we can attach our sample to a thin candelaver, apply a field, such a deflection caused by a torque will change, will deflect the candelaver, and from the deflection, from such a small angular change, we know the torque, now we can know the magnetic moment. Okay, so, that th so this is the picture of my setup. Typically, well, I have a, first I have a penny here to show the size of my setup. The cantilever sits right here. It's made by gold. Well, it's cut just by my hand. The sample is glued to the tip of the cantilever. And at the bottom, you can see here, we attach a thin metal foil. Well, actually, with a thin metal film. Now, we just measure the capacitance between this metal foil and this thin film to detect the deflection of my cantilever. By doing that, I know the exact angle, exact deflection, exact bending of my cantilever. I know the torque, and I know the magnetic moment. The great advantage of this simple setup, it works in broad temperature range from always lowest temperature we can achieve, 20 millikelvin, to almost room temperature. And it has greater resolution, almost four orders, bad, 
four orders of magnitudes better than a commercial magnetometer. Okay, so we have a sensitive magnetometer. Hopefully, we are able to read something out of that. But again, how do we know what's seen is exactly what happens? Now, again, I want to emphasize that there are two different interesting properties for what happens in regular silicon-based interface. It's exactly like this. Spins are, per, are randomly pointing to different directions. M goes linear with H. And as you see, torque is M times H, so it's quadratic. Solved from a magnet, later we'll see that my, be, my signal looks exactly like what this. In this, in this substance, M is quickly saturated to certain values. And by, by, go, by getting the product of M and H, it goes as linear and symmetrical. Okay, so now I describe how we know exactly the measurement signal comes from the interface, and we do certain kind of control experiment. But basically, we have two families, some without interface and some with interface, right? And we do measurement in this geometry, and here, let's just look at results. Without anything, the cantilever shows me almost nothing. With this background sample, the signal is really small. It's a small parabola, as what we emphasized before. It's just like a paramagnet, which means it's simply like what happens in silicon. This is a real sample. The red curve shows the signal comes from the interface sample. The magnitude is almost two, old, two orders of magnitudes larger than the background. It's reversible. More importantly, and very low fields, near zero fields, it's linear and it's symmetrical. And as I emphasized before, such a symmetrical linear dependence is exactly what we are expecting from a soft fermion magnet. Let me emphasize this point by plotting the same curve, torque versus H, in this plot below two Tesla. Again, in the very low fields, they're straight and they're symmetrical. Getting the M by dividing torque and H, you can see near zero field within milli Tesla. It's jump finite values. That tells me there is a magnetic ordering in this substance, in these samples. And then tell, tells me that there is a magnetic ordering even coming from these boring non-magnetic materials. Okay, so let me quickly summarize what we have seen. By doing two different measurements, we talked about the charge property and spin properties of this interface between length of luminate and strontium tinnitus. By combining these two measurements, we know, and this interface, we are having a two-dimensional magnetic system, a conductive two-dimensional magnetic system that may be able to be the new candidates of the future electronics. Okay, let me thank my advisor, Ria Shri, my collaborator, and, and Yogan Mahas group, and particularly to Neil and Jane. Without your wonderful stop, such work is impossible. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Lou. Uh, Neil, you want to start? Where did the two materials come from in, in the first place? Where did the two materials come from in the first place? Very good question. As we see, we have some boring materials. They are well known. They are well known by chemists, by, by physicists. They are, um, well, they are commercial available. They were made from rocks, basically. From me. <laughs> Minerals, yes, right, yeah. Well, now, w to answer your question more precisely, our collaborator bought the substrate and deposited a thin film of the other substance on top of that. By doing this, they make an interface. It's not exactly like, like what I described, putting two rocks together to get an interface, not really like that. But by doing this kind of growth, we are getting great conductive interface, and we are getting wonderful candidates for electronics. Imagine taking a, a piece of chalk and glass and just write, making a thin layer on the glass with the chalk. Would that work? <laughs> uh, that, may gr that may work for graphene. <laughs> <laughs> George. How determines the voltage? 
get the transition in the capacitance? This is a very good point. It's not clear. It's determined by the by the what we put on top of this interface, and it's also determined by the carrier density of the interface. So as you may see in the in the plot I showed you, the transition point happens in positive voltage. And we find out such a position happens, such position varies as the thickness of the top layer thin film, also as a, as a materials, as, as a different materials of what we put on the top surface. So, it, so we can control that, basically. So far, no. We, we do not have a theoretical prediction. What happens when you combine the electric effect and the magnetic effect together? How, do you, how does the electric field affect the magnetism? This is a wonderful point. My proposal relies on this scenario, right? We have electrical field effect, and we have a magnetic ordering state. We hope that mag, mag electrical field can change the spin property in certain junctions, right? So my current answer, no, we don't know that yet. But my feeling is that we may be able to change the magnetic ordering temperature by applying certain electrical voltage. Let, let me ask a, a, a question of understanding about this. It, you describe the magnetic ordering as being analogous to the use of hard drives for storing data with the little magnet domains of magnetic ordering. Uh, the flash drives, some drives, do they use the electric effect, electric ordering? And, right. and, and, and then can one think of, at least vaguely, combining those two technologies in one device that has both electrical the ability to manipulate and store electrical states and magnetic states. And so it's like combining a thumb drive and hard drive. Well, wow, that's a wonderful point. That's a wonderful point. I think, that, as I say, thumb drive does not use the spin property. Right. And, and you can see the small innovation in the approach for electronics makes life much easier, right? Now I'm using a computer with, with real hard drive, but you, you can see Mac, uh, Mac Air, where they are use, only using solid state hard drive, for example, flash drive. It's much lighter, it's much faster, right? Well, for me, maybe this interface could be something make even better computer, much faster computer chips, and a much larger hard drive. Great, and, and new technologies probably that we haven't even dreamed of when you combine them. So, uh, how many patents did you say we had, Jocelyn? <laughs> There may be a few more waiting here. Are there other questions for Lou? Okay, let's thank Lou for his talk. Thank you.